Hello, good morning, and welcome back to the basement. <clears throat> My name is Bob. So I want to talk for a few minutes today about a couple shop hacks uh, around the idea of a milling machine. To be more specific, a mill drill, also known as a round column mill. So first let's talk about what does milling mean? Now most people are familiar with the concept of drilling. In drilling, we take a drill bit and we spin the drill bit and the center point of the drill bit cuts through the material where we would like to have a hole. I talked about that last time. Milling is a similar idea but it's a different direction. In milling we take an end mill which looks like this. Now an end mill has a little bit in common with a drill bit in that it has flutes. It has sharp spiral edges that are designed to cut. But an end mill is not intended to cut a hole straight down into a material. An end mill is intended to cut a groove through a material moving laterally, moving to the side. So classic use of an end mill would be to mount the end mill in the spindle, not in a drill chuck, I'm just kind of doing this for demonstration purposes and to mount some material here in this vise and by using the force of the table move the material and the result is a groove. In fact if we look here these channels in this actual milling table were created with a mill that was put down to the depth and then drug across forced across while it was spinning in order to clear the chips. In fact, this pocket in the milling table was created with an end mill in the factory where the mill was put down spinning and pulled around in order to create a clean pocket. So classic milling is creating a channel. Another type of milling is to create a face. And to create a face, you would use something like a fly cutter or what's called a shell mill or a face mill that is spinning in a way that it has protrusion sticking downward and it, it leaves a flat surface as it is drawn across. So the first hack I want to talk about, uh, a, and by hack I just mean an expedient approach that works well is effective and inexpensive and one of the things I have found about this mill drill this mill drill has an R8 uh, shank in the spindle which is to say that the socket in the end of the turning spindle here is an R8 shaft what that means is it has this shape it's, uh, I think it's an inch here, and then this is conical shape, and there are threads inside here, and a drawbar bolt that is way up in here. The drawbar is screwed down through the spindle and into the end of the R8 shank, which is serving to pull it up into the socket and fasten it in place. Because it's conical, it's drawn up, it, it can't wiggle around, and it's merely the friction against this cone-shaped surface that keeps it from spinning. Now, R8 is incredibly strong. Um, it's incredibly stable. It's what you would find, for instance, on a bridge port mill. The problem is that in order to change out bits or tools in the spindle, I have to remove the bolt that's way up in the top. So I have to get a step ladder, I have to get a crescent wrench, I have to loosen up the bolt, tap on it in order to drop the R8 shank down out of the spindle. What I have found is that the R8 shank is stronger than the machine itself. Which is to say, I don't need something as strong as an R8 shank for most operations. What I do day to day is I do light duty milling, uh, light duty channel groove milling, light duty face milling, and a whole lot of drilling. 
So what I've elected to do is I have installed into the spindle of my mill an ER25 collet holder. ER25 signifies the size, but essentially what I have is a conical shaped opening here and it uses conical shaped collets to grip whatever I put here in this hole. So for my purposes, in order to switch things out quickly and easily, all I have to do is use ER25 collets to hold whatever I intend to put in here. The most common thing I put in here is a half inch drill chuck. This half inch drill chuck happens to be off of a Bosch uh, half inch electric, uh, half inch battery operated drill. And the drill was dead so I salvaged the chuck and I simply made a threaded um, arbor that screws into the drill chuck and then has a 13 millimeter shank and so if I want to install the drill chuck I slip it up in there and tighten up the nut and now I'm ready to use the drill with regular drill bits. If I want to use a face mill, if I want to plane the top of a surface flat, then I reach over here and I grab my expedient face mill, drop the drill chuck out, put in the face mill, and now I'm ready to do face milling. If I want to, say, uh, cut a channel using a traditional end mill, I'm going to reach over here and grab a half inch end mill. If I want to cut a half inch channel in something, I just slide in the half inch end mill. But I can do all of these operations without getting out a step ladder, without having to get up here and mess with the draw bar. And most importantly, not having to buy a million devices with this big R8 shank because big R8 shank devices are comparatively a lot more expensive than ER25. I got a whole set of ER25 collets and this holder for something like $25. So I do all my swapping out um, with one exception. The only time I ever pull out the ER25 collet holder is if I'm using my big boring head. And um, uh, in, a, in a video you'll see coming up soon, I need to cut some four inch holes in one inch steel plate. And to do that, I used my big boring head. And for that, I have a spindle, an arbor, that is the traditional R8 shank and goes up in there. Because there is so much torque out here at these edges that um, you need the, the beef of the big R8 shank to properly use this boring head. The second hack, shop hack, that I want to talk about is I keep holding up this object or this object and calling it a face mill. These objects are in fact not face mills at all. These actually are carbide tipped hole saws intended to cut through um, metal, steel, whatever, um, perhaps even t to some degree hardened steel. Um, I get these off of eBay. They're very inexpensive. This is a 38 millimeter carbide tipped hole saw. TCT it's called. I don't know what the TCT stands for. The 38 millimeter cost me something like five dollars. And this one I just got the other day, uh, just a couple days ago. This is a 50 millimeter carbide tipped TCT hole saw. And as it turns out, the form factor of these is more or less indistinguishable from a real face mill. Now they're not nearly as beefy and rigid as a real face mill or shell mill with, with replaceable carbide inserts. However, the total cost of this 50 millimeter hole saw that I'm going to be using as a shell mill, the total cost was $5.93 shipped. So I can buy this entire object for cheaper than I can buy a single insert to put into a real shell mill or face mill. The shell mill or face mill itself, I would have to pay, oh, at a bare minimum, $65, probably closer to $100. 
And then I also have to get an arbor to screw it on for something like $50. So my cost of a real shell mill face mill would be something like 200 bucks. And then I have to replace the carbide inserts as they wear out or become dull. Or for $5.93, I can simply buy a new one of these from time to time. Now, the reason I've bought one at all is because this one is broken. It did not break under use. It broke when I dropped it out and it bounced off of here and landed on the concrete and it broke off two teeth the first time I dropped it. And I'm a genius. I admit it, I'm a genius. And it broke off another tooth the second time I dropped it. You would think that I would learn to get a little more careful. I would like to think of myself as being a little more careful, but nonetheless, I dropped it twice, broke off teeth each time that I dropped it. But it's been used quite a bit. It still isn't dull. And the teeth were in fine condition until I dropped them on the concrete. So what I'm gonna be covering here in the final part of this video is taking this raw TCT hole saw, carbide tip hole saw, and modifying it for quick use within my ER25 collet. And finally, another little quick shop hack that I have found is that I don't have room in my shop for both a drill press and a mill. So this thing being a mill drill, in my case, it really is. It's both my mill and my drill press. I do a lot of drilling on it. And to that end, a quick way to convert it between mill with a vise to hold the part and do the milling or drill press is this little chunk of wood. This is a MDF and I've made it into a uh, perfunctory drill press table. So open the vise up to however wide this strip is. Clamp the vise down and now I have a sacrificial wood drilling surface with a back fence. So first things first, loosen up this screw and get rid of the pilot drill. We don't need that anymore. Next thing we're going to be doing is grinding clearance inward on these teeth so that the chips go to the center of the mill. To do that, I have on the grinder a diamond uh, plate, um, a diamond grinding disc. It only has grinding media on this side. This side is, is inert. So I'm going to have the carbide tips in this configuration right here. I'll be using the rest and I will just visually grind it until I have the proper angle in there. I will stop the camera and restart it once I'm grinding. Once I'm grinding, I will be wearing a respirator and eye protection. Uh, it's my understanding that grinding in carbide or breathing in carbide dust is uh, is a, a very bad thing to do. So I'll be wearing a respirator and of course eye protection. So I'll bring you back once I am suited up and grinding away. Having given it some clearance to the inward center of the teeth, I'll now grind here to give it clearance as it's passing the cutting edge of the material.
So notice now, like if you look at that tooth, that there is angular clearance and to the center clearance. The last thing I'll do is clean up the bottom rake of these teeth where I nicked it in the grinding process. And then I will take a diamond disc in a Dremel tool and just very gently round off the corners to make them a little less brittle. So there is the grind of carbide teeth. Now all we have to do is make it fit the collet. All right, so now here we are at the lathe. I took it to the wire wheel and uh, got rid of the, the red paint just so that I can accurately indicate it for roundness and for, uh, for wobble, for, for being true in the... So we will mount it up in the four jaw, the four jaw chuck that is. A four jaw chuck can hold irregularly shaped parts. Well, it can hold just about anything. And you use the indicator to get the piece true into the center. So I'm looking at where the teeth are gonna be. I wanna get it to, to where I'm not gripping any teeth directly. I want to be gripping a spot that is adjacent to the teeth but not on the teeth. See that one is right on a tooth. That's not going to be good. Let's see if we can find another spot here. Rotate it a smidge. Now we're missing. Now we're missing. Now we're hitting that tooth. So what I'm going to have to do is put a spacer between the chuck jaw and one of the things I like to use for a spacer in that situation is a, a little bitty nut in this case a 632 nut makes a nice little spacer so I can slip the the nut right here and then the pressure of the jaw will be against this outer ring So now, we get the indicator on the magnetic stand. So I'm going to bring you in so you can see the indicators right there. So that as I, as I spin the chuck around, this plunger moves in and out with the, with the ring. And once I get this needle to stop moving, then I have the piece centered in the jaw. I learned to do this watching a bomb 79 Keith Fenner. It's not bad at it. In fact, there might be a bit of contentious debate over who is, in fact, the best at it. In fact, believe it or not, there are competitions to see who is the fastest at it. There's really no such thing as being the best to do it right or you haven't done it right. But there definitely is faster and slower. I'm willing to bet that I am not the fastest. I'm going to say that I'm more like the tortoise. Slow and steady gets the job done. Eight. Eight. Almost eight. Yeah, so that's within a quarter of a thousandth in 
the side to side direction or to, to being centered on the shaft to being uh, concentric with the lay of the shaft. Now, because I want the teeth to all hit the material at the same time, we're going to see if it is um, wobbling. And it definitely is wobbling. So, that's the low point which means that where the nut at, where I've inserted the nut is the high point. So I will use a brass hammer and tap it. Uh, I don't guess you can see what's going on. I'll break it out. High point right there, low point right there. The flat part, I need to. All right, that's two thousandths. I'm gonna call that good enough. All right, so now all we have to do is machine this shaft down to something in the neighborhood of 13 millimeters. All right, so it's currently about 17 millimeters. I know that because I measured it before we began. So there, and we'll turn the machine on and do a little machining. Phase converter, rotary phase converter. Fire in the hole. So I'll take a cut all the way across. And then I'll get a measurement and we'll find out how close we, how close the target is. And I'll take most of it off in one pass. Okay, 607, need to take off exactly 100. All right, as long as that's anywhere near a half inch or AKA 13 millimeters. So, let's see how it cuts, shall we? We'll reach up here and remove the drill chuck. Install our new fancy new face mill. Tighten it up. And let's see what we have to how about a piece of aluminum. Let's try, get brave and try 50. Okay, my battery died, but uh, so I finished up that piece of aluminum. In the middle is a piece of drop forged steel. And on the far left is a piece of cast iron. Just to give some idea of the surface finish. I can tell you that it is silky smooth. I cannot feel any. And the drop forged steel, I can feel a little bit of a pattern. But the cast iron and the aluminum both just feel smooth and slick. So. Is it a $200 face mill? No. Is this machine capable of really 
making use of a $200 face mill? No, it is not. But for a six, $5.99 face mill, I'll take it every day. And hey, thanks for watching.